If you haven't already figured it out yet, my passion and speciality is astronomy. And I like to think that I know my onions. So imagine my interest when someone sends me this link to his video. So this video is gonna be a, a challenge, a duel, if you like, for Simon Dan. Now, Simon Dan lives in the UK, as I do. So in theory, you know, he could uh, choose his weapon, rapiers or pistols at dawn. But I think that would be a bad idea. So do I. I'd be toast in minutes. Fortunately for me, he wants to talk about a certain planet. And unfortunately for him, it's my favourite one. Mars. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Tin for Tuesday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Yes, the opening clip was from a channel called The Kurgan, and to be fair to him, he's been nothing but respectful when asking me to take a look at his video. With this in mind, I'm going to return the favour and keep things civil. So let's kick off and take a look at his points regarding Mars. The first part is that Mars could support life, and I'll cover that. Um, the second sort of part or continuation of that is what evidence do I have that that life that could support was intelligent or human type life. And then part three, the fact that Mars got destroyed uh, by intelligent action rather than random events. And, and then I've got a sort of a part four, which is more circumstantial evidence, which I just add in tack on to the end, but. So the Kurgan has evidence that life existed on Mars, it was intelligent life, and that it was purposefully destroyed. Interesting. Here we go then. If uh, so, all of this started more than 23 years ago now when I wrote this. And uh, this, this is the latest version, you know, this is the original, older version. Uh, this one's got pictures in it. This one doesn't have pictures in it, but the pictures are on the on the website. <clears throat> you can go to my blog and see all the images much better on a computer than you can in a, in a book print. That to me looks like the famous face on Mars, a photo taken by Viking One in 1976. I do have some thoughts on that, but we'll let him continue for now. And the original NASA images and so on. So, in that book, which I wrote 23 years ago now, <clears throat> I made certain assumptions on certain things because if you're gonna have life on Mars, you need at least at a minimum three things. You need an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which has, you know, on our planet, it's about 21% oxygen, 98% nitrogen, and about 1% of, you know, random rare gases and so on. For clarity, I'm sure he meant to say 78% nitrogen, not 98% nitrogen. Um, you need to have, you know, probably, you don't have to have 21% oxygen. You can probably get away with something like 10% oxygen for humans to live on it. Now this is the first point of contention for me. Whilst it would be possible to survive at these levels of oxygen, mental functions would be extremely impaired and respiration would be intermittent. Um, and you can probably go all the way up to, I don't know, 30% oxygen or something like that, although that might be dangerous if you try and light a match, I'm not sure. And you'd be right to be not sure. Oxygen itself is not a fuel. So there wouldn't be any sort of atmosphere blowing up sort of thing. But what I'm saying is the range, there's a range there, you know, it doesn't have to be exact 21 or 20% oxygen. It's somewhere near that ballpark will be enough. And we know Mars had oxygen. How do we know? Because it's kind of red. And uh, Simon Dan himself knows this. He mentioned it in his video. The reddish tint of the planet is due to um, oxidization, which happened when they, uh, previously what I believe was the existing atmosphere and certainly what was the existing water got disassociated, the, 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 the oxygen becomes very reactive and oxidizes pretty much everything it finds and that's why you get that rust sort of colored look. So This could certainly be the case. There is some evidence to suggest that the atmosphere on Mars once contained more oxygen than it does now. There's pretty solid evidence that Mars at one point probably had a decent enough, oxygen-rich enough atmosphere to support life. I wouldn't say that it definitely is. An oxygen-rich atmosphere in itself is not a solid indicator that there was once life in the past. 
more importantly, perhaps even than that, is that we have a, a lot, huge amount of evidence that Mars used to have flowing water. So it wasn't water in the form of ice, and it wasn't just water in the form of clouds and so on. Mars had an ocean. I certainly cannot argue that flowing water once existed on Mars because the rovers have uncovered huge amounts of evidence for this, and it may be flowing still today. And also there are water ice caps at the poles, but the ocean hypothesis is just that, a hypothesis. And I wouldn't say there is any definite proof of that at the moment. It's certainly a possibility for sure, but not definite. The northern hemisphere of Mars was an ocean. And again, we know this because there are evidence of huge floodplains on Mars that are at least an order of magnitude and sometimes more than the largest evidence we have, geological or otherwise, of any flood, including the tsunamis that killed you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Mars has had floods or tsunamis, call them what you want, these huge catastrophic flooding events that are an order of magnitude larger than anything we've ever had on Earth. Again, whilst this is possible, I would argue that these vast plains are caused by volcanic eruptions between three and four billion years ago. It is something we've seen on almost all of the rocky bodies in the solar system. Considering that Mars is roughly, you know, about half the size of Earth, um, um, very rough measurements, right? That's pretty impressive. And that didn't happen because of wind, okay? That happened because of asteroid impacts, which is what destroyed Mars. But those asteroid impacts didn't happen naturally. Hmm. I'm not convinced that this is the case, but we'll continue. Now, it also had a magnetosphere. I didn't know that when I wrote this book, but I posited in it that if I'm correct about my theory, then Mars must have a magnetosphere, must have had one at some point. And I found out only after I wrote the book and uh, very around the same time, pretty much, just or just after or just before, the scientists had discovered that yes, uh, NASA work, uh, satellites that had landed and whatever, basically proved that Mars did used to have a magnetosphere. And I concur here. The discovery of large amounts of magnetic material does indeed suggest that there was once a magnetosphere around Mars. Which was quite interesting to me because I didn't know that when I first wrote it, but so it tends to support the theory. Now, how did it lose its magnetosphere? How did it lose its rich oxygen rich atmosphere? How did it lose its oceans? It got hit by asteroids, a bunch of them. And this is unfortunately where we disagree again. Um, and, you know, if you hammer a magnet, it loses its magnetism. So that's why the magnetosphere is gone. Also, Mars pretty much almost got cracked open like, a, like an egg, you know. There are some theories that suggest that asteroid impacts are the reason that Mars lost its magnetosphere, but not for the reason that the Kurgan is saying either. But that theory isn't really widely accepted. The most commonly accepted theory is because of Mars's smaller size, the outer core cooled at a much quicker rate than ours did. The convection current stopped and the magnetosphere was no longer produced. Whichever way it happened, they were both natural. But these asteroid impacts, they were not natural. And this is where I show you that I'm not crazy and I didn't channel this. That's fine. But the problem with that theory is that there are craters on every single rocky body in the solar system. The late heavy bombardment was a time of intense asteroid impacts in the inner solar system around 4 billion years ago. The asteroid impacts on Mars have a certain pattern. The smaller asteroid impacts are older, the slightly bigger ones are younger, and the really big ones that finish the planet off are the most recent asteroid impacts that, that have occurred. I have never ever heard, studied or read anything that suggests that crater size is related to age. And if that truly was the case, how do you explain this picture? This is Beer Crater and there are smaller craters inside it. How can that be if the smallest craters are the oldest? Now, we can tell this because it, it's relative, right? So the little asteroid impacts get covered over by the slightly bigger ones, or in other words, you can see smaller impacts that are you know, half buried under the edge of uh, bigger impacts. And then you've got the Hellas Basin and the Argyle Planitia, which are, you know, two huge craters formed by two huge impacts of asteroids that, um, 
were broken up in the atmosphere and, and hit the planet. Hellas Basin is a crater that's 1,600 kilometers in diameter. It's roughly the size of South Africa, you know. Uh, it's a big hit, and consider that Mars is only a little bit more than half the size of Earth, pretty much. Argyle Planitia is another impact crater 900 kilometers in diameter. So those two impacts finish the planet off. But again, there are craters inside the Hellas Basin, so still not really sure how that theory works. But there were smaller impacts that happened before that. The thing is that all of these impacts, the small ones, the medium ones, and the two big ones, all happen in a very short period of time. How do I know that? Because asteroid impacts are relative, right? You could say, yeah, well, so what? You know, Mars might have had all that stuff. It might have had an atmosphere, it might have had flowing water, it might have had an ocean, but over time, as it got hit by random impacts, and eventually got hit by a big asteroid or two, it died. Yeah, well, it didn't happen by chance. And I would argue that it did during the late heavy bombardment. I expect Dan to know this, so I'm not saying this for him necessarily, but you know, asteroid clouds are not like in Star Wars. You, you don't get a bunch of asteroids all floating right next to each other. That's just not how it works. Spot on. In the asteroid belt, for example, astronomers estimate that the average distance between two asteroids is around 950,000 kilometers. There's thousands of kilometers between them at the best of times, if not hundreds of thousands of kilometers. So, and they all hit Mars pretty much around the same time. How do I know this? Because the southern hemisphere of Mars has from 10 to 100 times the number of impacts than the northern hemisphere of Mars. So why would that be? I would argue because the whole planet was bombarded and then volcanic activity covered a lot of the craters in the northern hemisphere with volcanic material. Well, two reasons. One, if you have an ocean in the northern hemisphere, anything that lands in the ocean that's not really you know, huge isn't going to leave as much of a trace as anything that lands on the southern hemisphere where you've got land mass. Furthermore, the impacts in the ocean would you know, create floodplains and the, for the, the actual crater of, in the ocean would be pretty much wiped out as it happened. But there's another reason. Because if these asteroids are being flung onto the planet intelligently or for, you know, because of a war, where are you going to throw those asteroids? You're not going to throw them in the ocean where nobody lives. You're going to throw them on the landmass where the people live because that's what you're trying to destroy. All very speculative again, I'm afraid. How would a race even throw an asteroid? And if you're on a planet that's being bombarded by asteroids, what are you going to do? You're going to try and shoot those asteroids and break them up so they burn up in the atmosphere, you know, or shoot them up even much further away if possible so they miss the planet entirely. So I know it sounds really like science fiction, but bear with me, you know, we're allowed to think crazy thoughts for a moment, right? And then you can shoot them down. That's why I'm making this video. Dan, try and shoot down every one of my points, right? I'm doing my best, buddy. The thing is, if you have anti-gravity technology, and I'll come to that, I've done a couple of videos on anti-gravity as well, so just ignore it for a moment. Let's just pretend anti-gravity technology exists, and it does exist, by the way, but we'll get to that. That's another video, right? Yes, we won't comment on that, but I guess that's how you think that this race battered Mars with asteroids. Far too much speculation going on here for me, and if this is the crux of your argument, then I'm afraid you don't have one. Let's move on to the reasons for Mars having intelligent life living on it in the first place. But the thing is, you know, I'm saying that it had intelligent life. Well, what evidence of this do I have? That's it. That's pretty much the title of the book, the face on Mars, right? There's a huge face there. There's pyramids next to it. There's what's called a fort next to it. And again, you're saying, oh, well, they just look like pyramids. No, they're pretty much pyramids. I don't think that anyone is claiming that they're not pyramids. However, such a geological formation can be created naturally. The face, on the other hand, is a classic case of pareidolia. The phenomenon of seeing faces and objects in things that aren't really there. Proven by the fact that a later, higher resolution image showed the face to be nothing more than just a rocky outcrop. Um, the guys who first discovered it, the Pietro and Molinar, uh, in 76, they wrote a book about this and they did some image analysis of the face and of the nearby objects and they came to the conclusion that it could be artificial. 
In fact, when I started writing this book uh, 23 years ago, I was writing a fiction book. I didn't believe the face on Mars was, was artificial. I thought it was just a bunch of rock to look a bit like a face. Well, there we go then. The Kurgan goes on to talk about some scientists that have done some work to try and show the face is artificial and then moves on to NASA. But again, you know, if you don't believe me, you know, if you think NASA's telling you the truth, uh, get another book called The McDaniel Report, written by uh, Professor McDaniel, who's a professor of science, and he's put this report together again over 20 years ago, which documents, without any shadow of a doubt, all the lies that NASA has come up with, with respect to the face and its other things as well. But again, we're talking about documents that are decades old. Take a look at how the face has changed over the years as we've used better and better cameras to photograph it. I think there was intelligent life on Mars for two reasons. One, the face, the pyramids and so on. Two, the way Mars was destroyed. I wouldn't place any confidence in a face that's not a face and some speculation as to how Mars lost its magnetosphere. And there's another further piece of evidence, which is, you know, I've, I've mentioned a few points about why Mars was destroyed intelligently. The asteroid impacts that destroyed Mars happened in a very short period of time. If they hadn't, you would have a pretty much even distribution of asteroids between the su southern hemisphere and the northern where the ocean was. You don't have that, which means they happen in a relatively short period of time. You know, maybe days, maybe months, maybe a couple of years, but that's what you're looking at. You're not looking at thousands, you're not looking at millennia, right? There is absolutely no evidence to suggest that every crater on Mars was formed within a two year period or shorter. The, the, statistically, it's not gonna be possible for a planet to be bombarded, you know, an order or two of magnitudes more on one side than on another. It just doesn't make any sense. But, um, there's more than that. Mars still has two unspent bullets floating around it, Phobos and Deimos. Now, I'm not going to entertain this point at all. The Kurgan believes that the two moons of Mars were asteroids that, for whatever reason, didn't hit their intended target. There are a number of reasons as to how Mars obtained its two moons, but not having a firm one doesn't mean that they are unspent bullets. So. Those are pretty much my, um, my reasons. And then, you know, the last part, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. Now, the things that I've set up to now, Dan, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you um, I'll go through them all and I'll just... And I hope I have done so with enough clarity. I'm not gonna address any of the circumstantial stuff because this video is already longer than I would have liked it to be. Some very interesting theories from the Kurgan there, but I'm not convinced. Thank you very much for joining me for today's Tim Ford Tuesday. I do hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do see that you like the video as well as subscribe. I have been your ever loyal host, Simon Dan, and I'll see you all on Friday where the Eclipse Saga continues. See you then.